we have one more guest that we want to put on. He is a spokesperson for uh, Young Voices and also host of Beltway Banthas uh, podcast. I, I find him interesting, funny, and uh, really uh, a credible guy. Stephen Kent, a uh, millennial voice of the uh, conservative movement. Welcome to the program. How are you? Uh, good morning. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back. So, Stephen, give me your thought on uh, on the speech last night, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer's speech. How this is going to play out? What do you think is? What do you think last night meant? Well, I agree very much with your White House correspondent, John Miller, in that Trump just could not read from the prompter. And it was really it was really worse than ever. No charisma. And for him, I think that can be incredibly damaging. I was expecting like a little bit more gusto and conviction and maybe jazz hands for his final pitch on his precious wall project. I mean, this has been what his entire political career has been about. And he didn't sell it. And by the way, the Democrats looked terrifying as well. It was like Emperor Palpatine and the Joker making a national address. <laughs> and it was, it's kind of scary. And the substance was intellectually dishonest and cynical as well. And I think there was plenty of that to go around between the president and his adversaries in Congress. Like nobody even attempted to move the meter for their side. And I think that's pretty sad when you look back on some White House speeches from days past that really aimed to try to move people, not just terrify or belittle them. Okay, so wait, hang on just a second. Where do you think the president was trying to terrify or belittle? I, I thought he, I, I thought he uh, spoke with the facts for the most part. Um, I thought he even said, look, it, it, this is a humanitarian thing. Uh, we don't have the space for these people. We just don't have the resources. We need more resources. And, you know, it, it's a wall. If they want to do a fence, we'll do a fence. But we have to do this. Yeah, so he he paid sort of uh, homage to the, the humanitarian crisis on the border very briefly. It was kind of a couple of sentences, and then he really moved on to like the law and order portion of this. I mean, some really gruesome stuff, and, and the crimes that have been committed by some illegal immigrants across the country are no doubt gruesome. They're sad, but to spend, I think, that time from the Oval Office sort of doing this uh, just reciting of, of three, four, five, like really just awful crimes that you'd have to send your child out of the room uh, to hear from the president. I, that is not normal, and we've not seen that kind of thing before. And I also don't think it is appropriate to use that platform to talk about these instances as if they are a normal uh, and sort of like epidemic part of American life. You wouldn't accept that from President Obama on guns. You wouldn't accept that from a George Bush on the sort of epidemic of terror. You know, that's that's just not sort of our daily lives. And I think that was a misrepresentation. I do think we did hear that from Obama on with the guns thing here and there, maybe not in the in the Oval mm -hmm. Office. But do you think, Stephen, when it comes to the sort of delivery from President Trump, there's a report out today that basically he didn't even want to do this. Like, this is not something he was interested in doing. He doesn't want to do the, the photo op on the border. This yeah. is really not his passion. The issue might be his passion, but like this delivery system is just makes him uncomfortable, it seems. I'm really perplexed by that because I thought that was exactly what his thing was. I, I saw that report and I heard John Miller talking about it again earlier. And I, I'm just sort of shocked because this sort of seems like what he is made to do to sort of get on TV um, and pound his fist and give a give a speech about something that he's passionate about. And it really, you could see that he did not want to be there. So I buy that 100%. Um, I, I don't think so. I, hang on. I, I don't think so. I, I, I just really? don't think he is capable of delivering a script. I just don't think that's in him. He's much sure, better I, when he's just speaking off the cuff. Right. He's just, he's not an actor. Yeah. and, and well, I Were you in Home Alone too? Because I know strong. he was. Were you, Glenn? Were you in Home Alone too? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So go ahead, Stephen. No, no, it's it's kind of shocking to see that he wouldn't actually put his all into a platform like that. He's the president of the United States. He's been working for this for years, and it's his first opportunity to use that platform to his ends. And I, I think he really kind of fell on his face there. So, Steve, on the border, what do you do? Um, well, hang, hang on, before you get into that, you know, I, I, the, yeah. the, 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 the diminishing of crime, this is from the United States Sentencing Commission. So this is a U.S. source. Non-U.S. citizens accounted for 40.7% of all offenders in fiscal year 2017. So 40% of all federal offenses 
are happening from non-U.S. citizens, according to the government. That's yeah, pretty I mean, significant. Yeah, crime happens, and I think we have to do a better job of, of controlling who comes into this country, which I, I think is going to go to your next question about, you know, what do we do? Uh, there's, there's no doubt there. But again, that is a misrepresentation of the amount of people who come into this country, both legally and illegally. The, the, the majority of people who are in this country, technically illegally, are people who overstayed their, their legal rights to be here, their visas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't, we don't have sort of a mass epidemic of, of murderers climbing over a wall and running into Los Angeles. That's, that's not really what's going on here. So what do you do at the border, Sue? Yeah, I, I'm really conflicted. You know, I, I have conservative and libertarian tendencies, and they both fight for control every day. But <laughs> here's, my con here's my concession as a libertarian. I am very concerned that the populist movement in Europe um, is actively, if not already, overtaken U.S. politics. Um, and our traditional, more open political parties are rapidly closing. And voters, voters demanded something very radical with electing Donald Trump. A vote for him was a vote for the wall. And my fear is that ignoring this could have far worse consequences for the expanse of government than the project itself, which is just more of a cash hole and I think a bad symbol for the United States. I mean, what if Trump or the Trumps of the world, like they get frustrated enough to expand the infrastructure for the war on terror and homeland security to even further grow surveillance systems and Big Brother to monitor people for immigration enforcement? They already do this. I mean, if you live on the border, you're practically under drone surveillance all of the time. But imagine if it expanded more darkly. Like, so I just I wonder if the wall would at least tame the vitriol that has been boiling up in our politics for the past decade, even if it compromises some of our values and imperils our national spending problems a little bit more. Uh, but good on good on Trump for not invoking emergency powers and kicking this back to Congress because mm -hmm. this is their failure and they need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Stephen, thank you very much for the perspective. I appreciate it. Uh, spokesperson for Young Voices and uh, also the Bellway Banthas podcast, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, you only got one uh, nerdy Star Wars reference in there, which is a little disappointing. Yeah, yeah uh, it really is. I really mean, that's, is. we'll have to talk to him about that for next appearance. Um, I tend to agree with him, though, on the the border wall.